Hi guys, welcome to Cities and Dance Floors. Um, this is uh, probably the most exciting thing uh, we're working on at Middle Beast. Um, uh, obviously, this is under XP, under the scene pillar. Um, and uh, I went on a really nice journey. I went to four different cities, uh, starting with Berlin, then Amsterdam, Sarajevo, and finally New York. Um, in every city, I met some people. Some people I already knew before, and some people I met recently. Um, I, I can safely say that these people are, have now become uh, my friends, and people that are colleagues, and people that I, I love working with. Uh, and also on the panel, I have people from, uh, from Bahrain, from uh, our history, I guess, from um, our previous time. And in this session, we want to talk about um, what makes what, what is so important about nightlife and cities? How do these two things connect? And what does this create in terms of uh, opportunity? So I want to introduce my panel. Um, Uli, Isis, Merrick, Kerim, Marcel, Carlos, and Mazen. Um, and then I'm going to let each and every one of you introduce yourself and what you guys do and how you guys contribute to this global scene. All right, then I'll start. Thank you for this. Um, my name is actually Arne. I um, um, started out as a journalist in 2001. Uh, I want to be a music journalist um, and I specialized in electronic music because when I went to my first rave, I realized this is what I have been looking for for my whole life without even knowing it. So to be part of it, I started writing and I started documenting. Um, and um, I wrote a couple of books and contrib contributed to some documentaries. And now I'm some sort of expert and end up here. And the museum. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. It is, yeah that's, um, I was just talking to uh, Carlos and I said, well, I, I, I just never, I'd never decided, okay, I want to be the expert. But if you document for like 15 years, suddenly you are. And now um, last uh, month I opened a museum. It's called Our House. Um, and it's a, uh, it's a modern museum experience about electronic music culture. And it's uh, in the building uh, with one of our most uh, legendary and notorious clubs in Amsterdam. It's the only museum that turns into a club at night, so yeah, it's a first. Where else but Amsterdam? In daytime, it's a museum, and then within 45 minutes, it's changed to a proper club. Isis. Hi. Um, thank you. My, my name is Isis. I've been uh, DJing for 30 years. Um, I started my career in uh, 1992. Um, ever since, I've been um, developing myself in the world of electronic music as a, well, kind of an all-rounder, I would say. So I did parties, festivals, um, I run my own agency. Um, and then in 2010, I was uh, uh, elected as uh, the mayor of the night of Amsterdam. <laughs> and ever since, I've been um, diving into how um, the official institutes can guide the electronic music scene and the underground culture, um, and I have been part of the. Uh, I've been a board. I'm a board member of the Amsterdam Arts Council. I'm the chairman of the Commission Music, and uh, we're responsible for advising the local authorities on where to invest money uh, in culture, basically. Yeah. Let me say, I, I, I dove into this scene and I documented a lot. And this is an, is an enormous, badass, female pioneer legend. Yeah. Please know. Yeah. yeah, I couldn't uh, agree more. Age of 16, right? When you were DJing in Roxy. Um, I started when I was 16 and uh, at 17 I got my residency. Yeah. 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 <laughs> The most legendary club that shaped Amsterdam's future. Uh, my name is Merik Milan. Um, I'm uh, very pleased to be here. I uh, also helped to develop the strategy for XP uh, and also the program for this uh, first year. It was a great honor and it's, um, uh, I'm really happy to be here. Also, I've been a nightlife promoter all of my working life. 
uh, it helped me to develop my talents to who I am today. Uh, and I think that's the real value that nightlife brings. Um, a bit of acknowledgement, uh, because all of you were probably thinking, what is this sausage fest doing here on stage? Unfortunately, um, uh, Yasmina, we couldn't get her in the country due to COVID issues. Um, but just so you know that we didn't, that it was not top of our mind. I just have, I need to add that, that Merrick kind of is the mastermind behind Amplify and uh, he's the first person to, uh, presenting it to me and uh, you know, out of everything I saw that day, I was floored by this concept and uh, you remember the conversation we had after that, it was just something I had never seen and something I think the world has never seen and now we get to see nightlife from a very different angle, so thank you for that. Mr. McNass. <laughs> Hello, I'm Karim McNass, and uh, I'm uh, from Beirut, but I'm really representing Bahrain here. And uh, how did I get into this? Well, at the age of 10, I bought my first record. I haven't stopped buying records since. Um, started uh, playing drums when I was 11. I haven't stopped that. And started DJing mid-90s and have been in and out of that, but uh, back in. Started my first club in 99, and uh, the rest is history, as they say. So thank you. Hi, my name is Marcel. I come from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, when I'm listening to these guys, you know, like, uh, it's really an honor to be here. Um, basically, two decades ago, I went, entered in some kind of old warehouse I was 16 back then and it triggered me like I find some new family for me and, and since then I was always like uh, going towards the future with the concepts regarding the electronic music. We started the Bumsy conference and I invited this guy here. He couldn't come, then he connected me to that guy, that guy connected me to that guy. So basically like on the end of the day we are all family here so so i'm really appreciating this call and i think that we're gonna see much more in the future together thank you hello everyone i'm very happy to be here my name is carlo um i was um, born in malaga and i started making music there since 20 years um there there was no future the scene was very small so I decided to uh, find a different city. So I was moving to London. I was in London for two years, then to Barcelona, and ended up, ended up in Berlin. I'm in Berlin since 10 years, and there so I have my residency in Watergate. I started a label. I'm making music with Balu, which is like a beautiful project I had right now in my hands. And I'm super honored to be here and um, share my humble experience with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Mazen Masqati. I'm from Bahrain. I've been involved in this industry for about 35 plus plus years. Uh, I started scenes from Bahrain to the States to different parts of the world. And uh, I've been here trying to improve our scene in Bahrain and push for a better, better scene uh, like everyone else. Uh, started back in uh, we have the similar idea in Bahrain where we started a music conference like this one in, thir in 2013 and 2014, uh, which always trying to approve. And uh, this is a definitely a, a push in the right direction for us. I'm very excited to be here. So uh, I want to I wanna ask a question, and I want all of your answers individually. Uh, first one is, how do you see dance floors affecting society in each of your cities? Woo. <laughs> that's, well, that's a tough one. Um, well, during the pandemic, at least we realized it is more than just a party. My mother still thinks I'm partying all the time. When, they, when, when people ask, yeah, what, is, what Arne does for, for, for a living? Yeah? Partying, partying all the time. I said, no, mom, it is about express yourself. It's about uh, uh, diversity. It's about all forms of creativity. It's about producing. It's about show. It's about, it's about this whole eco uh, uh, system. And, it's, um, and the most important thing is a release. I mean, uh, society is uh, very, very hard, very fast. There's a lot of pressure. And this is the ultimate release. So I think 
uh, a city uh, with a good nightlife is, in my opinion, the most healthy city uh, you can imagine. It, I think it even comes first. Maybe you want you you were uh, yesterday we were talking because Arne speaks as you hopefully all know. There's only one youth culture streaming coming out of the Netherlands, and it was Gabber Gabber House. And you uh, addressed that yesterday. How how Gabber House also uh, that out of the house music, and then Gabber came up. Maybe you would like to that because that's also that really shaped our dance floor and shaped the future of. Yeah, I can tell a story. I mean, I can uh, I can I want to do it sh shortly as shortly as I can. House music landed in the Netherlands in two clubs, the Roxy and the Ith. Um, in the Roxy, they even had the battle. I mean, the, there was one DJ, it was called Eddie de Klerk, and he played for an empty dance floor, electronic music, for, for more than six months, until it was a financial disaster. But he said, no, 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 it's going to happen. And then at the end of the summer of 88, it happened. Uh, those, those clubs were very, uh, the other club was called the Ith. They were very into, uh, they were very into diversity and inclusivity. So they also had a very strict door policy. So like working class guys, normal regular guys, they most of the time they didn't get in. So what did they do? They started, they said to the Roxy, okay, okay, I can get in, well, I do my own parties. So from that came a whole scene of illegal raves. And there the music got harder and harder and harder and faster. And that evolved in the biggest youth culture, the ne authentic Dutch youth culture the Netherlands had ever had. Gabber with the hardest music. <laughs> and it was a nightmare of every parent because to, because to unify, they all shaved their head bald, even the girls or at least half of their head, and they wore a tracksuit. And they looked really trashy. And the parents, they hated it. But it was a commercial success like nothing ever seen before, more than Beatlemania in our country. So out of this, uh, there was one company, it's called IDNT. Uh, they, did, um, um, uh, they did the big hardcore parties, like with thousands of, of people. But since it was some sort of outlaw scene, they had to make this whole ecosystem. The, the scene had to make its own ecosystem of venues, of DJs, of producers, of record labels, uh, find out how to make the party safe and secure. Um, and then after a couple of years, the Gabber scene, the hardcore scene, completely burned out. It was just too fast, too commercial, too much. much. But the whole ecosystem was there. So IDNT decided, well, now what's next? So they said, okay, in this ecosystem, we're gonna put a more easy, radio-friendly music. And that's where Chesto comes in. <laughs> Chesto got very popular with trans, like with Armin van Buren and Ferry Corson. They got, he got very popular. And he got so popular that they threw um, uh, a party in a football stadium only with him. It's called Chesto in Concert. And after that uh, event, the paper said, this was the day uh, the DJ became a pop star. The birth of the stadium DJ, yeah. basically. So we, uh, th this is actually, yeah, uh, one, one short thing. A DVD, a DVD of the Chesso in concert landed on the desk of the organization of the Olympic Games in Athens in 2004. They asked him to, make, to, to play at the opening ceremony of the Olympics. And that was the biggest DJ gig ever for 1.8 billion people. And people like Hartwell and Martin Garrix, they, they say that was the moment we got inspired. They were like eight years old or 12, something like that. And they said, I want to be a DJ to, to see him. And this is like very shortly uh, an explanation of the big Dutch dance success. And I will not talk anymore in this panel. <laughs> Jesus. Well, Arne just told you everything you want to know. Um, no, I, I, was, <laughs> I was also there at the, 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 this period in time when the, the dancing exploded uh, in Europe. And um, uh, um, to me, it starts all with the music. So um, I always feel that I heard the calling of the drum and the beat just took me and it brought me to the dance floor. And it, it wasn't just me who heard the calling of the drum. And I realized, and it took a while because of course, we're all children of the Industrial Revolution and we're all used to modern technique and uh, m maybe sometimes also a bit of a machine-like thinking that sometimes the human aspect gets lost in this. And I think that's actually the part that fascinates me most. And also um, the 
parallels and similarities you can see worldwide in the dance scene. So it's obviously the beat is a very important element there, and it also connects us way back to our root culture, actually the indigenous layer that's under every society where everybody knows the drum and it's like comparable to the heartbeat you hear when you are in your mother's womb. So this binding element which brings us all together and something else I discovered is this beautiful book, it's called Drumming at the Edge of Magic, and it was uh, written by one of the two drummers of the Grateful Dead called Mickey Hart, and it's about the history of rhythm and drums. So um, the, the beautiful thing, it started back in the Stone Age, and it brings us all to the 90s. So when I found the book, I was like, wow, this is the explanation from where it all came. And in the book, it says something about the law of entrainment, and it's a, actually a Dutch invention. It was invented in, uh, what is it, 17th century by one of the uh, Huygens brothers, with his, which is a Dutch scientist from those days. And he found out if you put two clocks next to each other, they will start ticking in the same rhythm. And this is analog, you know, so there's no connection between these two objects, but they have the tendency to grow towards each other. And this is also what happens with people and with events and with music. So if we all listen to the same music at the same time, it makes us grow beyond our individual existence and we become a greater entity than we could ever be on our own. And that's what I think is really interesting. Oh, yeah. I thought you were just a legend. Eric. No, no, if you will allow me, I would like to pass on, uh, I would love to hear about Bahrain and yes. uh, enough uh, blowing on the Dutch horn, so. So, uh, just to touch very quickly on, on uh, Lebanon, because I moved back to Beirut in 2012, there were two or three uh, electronic music clubs. All the other clubs were all very, very commercial. And before the uh, explosion in the port, which decimated the entire nightlife, uh, almost, there were almost 10 electronic music clubs and there were maybe three really large commercial clubs. So what, what did this music bring to the dance floor? Um, a place where there's no showing off going on because all the commercial clubs, everyone dresses up and you know. So there's no real major showing off going on. It's all about dancing. It's about uh, communal uh, experience. And you strip away all the politics and all the religious stuff that's being carried around with you all day long, it just stays out the door and you walk in and everybody is unified by this music. So it has a, a tremendous impact on a country like Lebanon and specifically a city like Beirut. In the case of Bahrain, we also had many commercial clubs, not so many, but it's a very small country. When we, when we first opened Liquid, the first uh, kind of dance music or house music club, it became a place where people could, could feel freed from the, the eyes of everybody watching, almost the same way as, as Beirut was. So I feel that our, uh, electronic dance music is a little bit more honest, perhaps, or it creates an environment which forces you to be a little bit more honest with each other and with yourself. And it's, it's a tremendous impact. Um, yeah, that's it. So basically, it was 94 when the truck from the Desert Storm sound system from UK arrived to Bosnia during the war. And they were like the first promoters of this kind of electrical music back then. Uh, after that, when the war finished, like the sound of grenades changed the sound of techno. Uh, first raves were like in the warehouses, but we didn't have like the security people. United Nations were like the first security guys on, on the party, so everything was like DIY, 3D kind of thing, you know. Um, basically, like the um, different subcultures were connecting after the 12 in the parties because they didn't have their own place to hang out. So rave were somehow like the melting pot for all other cultures. 
and uh, that's something that gave him like real strong push and the people were like totally in that moment Europe is like uh, expanding like the Germany UK France they're all sending like exporting they start exporting music and we were like just like the first importers for that so basically the, the whole country like was triggered by it and it created like really great movement that's today like spreading in a different kind of varieties uh, in the global image we didn't give much but uh, we only gave two guys uh, one is Solomon and another one is Salvatore Ganacci so they are all Boston burn um, people and they have this kind of Balkan mentality in the different kind of emotions that are bringing to the world so basically that's like from our background I completely forgot the question. <laughs> How do you feel uh, nightlife affects society? Okay. More Ber let, let's talk about Berlin also. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to give like a Berlin approach about it. Um, I'm going to start with like a very f um, so a small history. Like when I do these parties in Watergate, when I used to do them before COVID, there was a guy coming every morning around 5, 4.30. He had uni at 8. So he was waking up super early, having a coffee, having a rave, and then going to the uni. It was because the parties, they were on Wednesdays. And this really is kind of the picture I want to give from Berlin. Dance floors are kind of the community, are the family. A lot of people are living alone. No, maybe they're sharing the flats, but these people, they might not be their family, their friends. So now with, with COVID in Berlin, it was very sad. A lot of people, they couldn't interact. I didn't see a, a lot of people for a long time during this period. Um, f yeah, this has been like um, affecting us very hardly. Um, also, um, the people in Berlin, they go always alone to the club. I mean, if you try to go to Bergen and you're a group of four, you're never going to get in. Like you can have a t like a, this, uh, this, this is like a signal. Um, this is something that creates community and tribe and it's actually connecting what Isis says, you know, that uh, it's like beyond this, like our ancestors, when we were in the caves. Um, yeah, this is the magic thing about music. Well, I was involved in, in, in early 90s with the rave scene, and I understood there is some sort of community built around that. People are nice to each other. I used to live in the States, and I realized there all different uh, background of people hanging out together without any question asked, without uh, you're Muslim or you're, you're black or you're white or, or so on. So it's like, that's really interesting. Not till I really went to Chicago and saw Frankie Knuckles for the first time. And I realized this is completely something, completely something different because there are people on the floor crying to the DJ booth, which something like, like, wow, this is moving because they're bawling and I'm just sitting there. It's like, why? It's, music is good, everything is cool, but why the crying? But then I really understood what it really means because this is who they really are. Because after the club, you will go to the after hours and the after hours in, 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 in apartment buildings where the grandma will be dancing until six o'clock in the morning which is something like I never really experienced in my life. It's just, there's a kid at six or seven, it's, it's, he's, on, oh, he's on the dance floor. So I thought this is something that I really want to be in and I want to bring back to where I'm from. And when I moved back in 2001, there Kareem already started Liquid and I was like, okay, this is not so bad. <laughs> I could belong here, you know? And then we started to build on that and, and, and do and do other events and, 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 and try to bring that particular experience to where we are and, and a lot of Chicago guys and a lot of that Detroit guys that had to come over because I think no matter what you do, you have to go back to the origin to really appreciate what really happened in this evolution that took 30 years or 35 years to become who we are here today which is a, something is really, really interesting. Without the past, there is no present, there is no future. And uh, to have something like this initiative in Saudi, where I could see positive, positive things comes in, maybe in the next five and 10 years, where the, where the scene becomes more mature. 
and 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 the people involved uh, understand the people before them what they did because I think in every country and in every scene you have to create local heroes and you have to create local um, clubs that that becomes the, the 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 place that people belong to and they will always talk about it they will also bring it back because it's not easy to start something when there is nothing and especially in people here that uh, 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 they have not really fully grasped what this what this what this movement is all about so when you try to come and try to push it and people might not take you seriously but if you keep at it you keep at it then you can see the change around and, and, and it pays off in the end. So uh, n nobody here is, uh, is from New York, but I like to think I'm from New York. So I'm, I'm going to talk about New York scene. Um, New York scene, um, you know, and its society uh, definitely have evolved over time. But there's one common thread that kind of keeps it all together, which is this constant state of reinvention. New York is always reinventing itself. It's always shifting, changing, and uh, you know I, I, the way I see it, it's like it's like uh, liquid. You know, you move it from one vessel to another, and it just takes that shape. And that's kind of what you know the the society in New York is actually looking like. The younger generation is now listening to very old disco, and it just speaks to the timelessness of the music that is actually played in New York. So. That's the connection. I want to get to my second question. How does um, uh, a city in its nightlife um, affect the creative output of a city? Merrick is the guy for this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's go. No, I think... Now, I think what is, um, you know, being now here... This is actually my first time in Saudi, but I've worked on this project for 18 months. Um, you know, I think where... I think there's real value in working on grassroots level. And I really also hope that, you know, that XP or everything which is happening around Soundstorm is that uh, it inspires uh, young people to think like, you know, it's not about, in, in, in all respect, it's not about organizing a, a, a Soundstorm straight away. It's about organizing an event with 50, 150, maybe 200 people. That's where we start. And I think, you know, um, and, 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 and that's really what I hope for. That's also how I started myself, you know, just organizing a party for 200 people. We did so many crazy things and it helped me to develop my talent. And I think that all, you, all of you in the room and we here on stage, but you're the people that are shaping the identity of your neighborhood, of, of your districts where you live, but also in the end of your city and also how the world views you. Um, and sees you. So, um, yeah, we, like, um, uh, I, I think the core is always, you know, um, if you are, uh, there, I think there's three key elements, which is always in place. I'm going to try, we'll try to make this short. There's three key elements. Every city where we go, where we speak about the role of the nightmare and how, does, how that helps to develop the city, there's always three key elements where we come back to, which is the creative community, so that is the, the producers, the DJs, uh, the, the promoters, everyone that is in that creative scene. It's the venue, the creative space. Also, the reason why, of course, Berlin, you know, why it ex there's an explosion of creativity. There was a lot of affordable space, a lot of space, old houses that could be used and repurposed. But it's also the framework conditions. So it's also the policies that are involved. And that is what I think is the golden triangle. And in, in the middle of that is that nightlife scene, that nightlife community. And here, for example, in Saudi, you need government because of the regulatory um, uh, approach. You know, and, and any party anywhere in the world, or not any, oh, no, that's not true actually, but like, uh, well, a lot of parties everywhere in the world are, you need government to be involved because you get a license. But also the regulatory framework can be there is no licenses. Like for example, in Sao Paulo, you know, if you have a club, you don't need that. You just start. So that's also how it happens. So it's always the content, it's the spaces, and the framework conditions, and that's for us what shapes the identity of cities. Thank you. Do you think? Do you think not having any licenses is actually good for Sao Paulo? Yeah. So yeah, yeah, because they don't have closing hours, you know. So of course, like. There's a lot of corruption also going on. So, but you know, you can, um, <clears throat> that, and that's a, a bigger uh, debate. That uh, uh, 
Okay, I'm just gonna drop it. So a lot of music, no, a lot of a lot of nightlife worldwide and culture is paid for by alcohol. Small music venues are paid for by alcohol. And um, so there's an opportunity here for Saudi for uh, for government to stay involved and to keep investing in grass on grassroot level because it won't be taken over by that other substance that also ruins a lot of lives. That's great. Thank you. Kareem, how, how have you seen Beirut and uh, Bahrain actually evolve with, with nightlife creatively? So, so just going back to the first question a little bit, um, what I saw in Lebanon, not just as a nightlife scene, but as a music scene, you know, I, I got to see Dead Can Dance perform live in a small festival in Zoo. And, uh, and I thought, wow, this is really like very left of center that they're bringing it to, to a small country like Lebanon. Um, over time, you start to see that that creates a, an, an atmosphere where artists feel that they have something else to express other than the typical pop or whatever's safe, that they can go beyond that. So I think that a, mu a, a very healthy, not just music scene, but art scene and a creative scene where so many things blend into each other, uh, theater and, and acting and uh, 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 makeup, you know, I mean, we had makeup artists who were part of the dance music scene. Um, those can contribute to a much larger creative output and expression. And that's what I feel um, was making Lebanon so exciting for both people living there and for tourism. Marcel. Wide topic. Not, not that wide. <laughs> I mean, think about uh, just what happened from the mid-90s to now in Sarajevo. Uh, I, I think basically like the um, electronic music in the night is like the plate where the, everything merges there, you know, like from the, from the creative forces to the technical to also like the governmental approvals and stuff like that. But there is always a way like to hack it, to improve it, to uh, jazz around it. So basically, like in our country, uh, we didn't have like allowance for anything. So we were like pushing every five year to push on the next level. So now in like two decades, we did like the four kind of stages of progression. You know, like uh, people were looking at us weirdly in the public transport if they see like something in your nose, different color of the hair, you know, like this kind of like subculture was arriving, but the people were like just like didn't know What's that, you know, like how, how to cope with it? But basically I think um, the global cities are like somehow uh, jealous on something that you're gonna have here is the energy of the beginning. That's like the, 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 the best thing that can ever happen, you know, like, and this kind of underdog positions through the history of the music is the best position. The, because through the documentaries and everything that you could watch or case studies, the underdogs did like the best thing, you know, like, because you're forced and then there's a accumulation of big energy and then you just channel it. The only thing is important is like to create the local pulse and go step by step, you know. Like that somehow that preserved us, even with the small country, but in some kind of, if you enter into the rhythm and you go like strategically, there is like a victory on the end, you know, like, but uh, j let's like just keep this kind of vibe the beginning longer as it possible because it's like the best uh, time ever, you know. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm gonna start with, um, I guess, the, um, the culture has also a negative impact and I wanna turn this negative afterwards in a positive thing. So when my wife was moving to Berlin 12 years ago, she was saying to the grandfather, I'm moving to Kreuzberg, and the grandfather was like, what? Like, because she's from a very small villa, uh, village from Bayer from the south of Germany, and Kreuzberg was like, this place is crazy. There is only like, uh, you know, crazy people there, artists and whatever. So I mean, Kreuzberg now, through the gentrification, is like a place where everything is bio and everything is like beautiful, very expensive, and it lost a little bit the soul. So in, in Berlin, we're experiencing how the clubs before they were like through along the river, I mean, Bar 25 was three, four days open, people partying there non-stop, 
and now this is no anymore. Like um, the whole river is built, it's like buildings. We have a huge stadium, and all the new clubs are um, now built in the uh, outside of the city. So in the I'm sure that in the future, Cross Bay is not going to be anymore like the place for the clubs, especially like um, when all the young people so they were moving there. Now these young people are not so young anymore. They have families and they are calling to the police like, yeah, the music is a bit too loud, no? <laughs> so <laughs> it's, uh, it's very controversial. How can we use this in a positive way? So for example, um, in, in the long run, I would love to move to my hometown, to Malaga, and there are a lot of uh, small towns in the mountains, which is amazing because you have like kind of sea views and you have in this Mediterranean surrounding um, these, these small towns, they are losing all the population. So I don't know, um, maybe we can use this to like uh, reinforce the, these, these small towns and do like artist towns, and bring a lot of like uh, people there that they can work like in not only music like visually there or anything and give like a new value to the area and tourism and very healthy and of course have an amazing party there that's that's the main point so yeah that's my thing well i think um i'll go for exposure we need to uh, show people what it is to get to get inspired and uh, by ex we live in, in a small country, Bahrain is a very small place. And uh, I thought by bringing different artists will, ex will pull, push, push people to understand it's done differently. So a few years back, I started something called Propaganda. It's a funny story because it's one night a month, my wife let me go out and do whatever I want to do. And I decided to do, to do a night where I will book people that I always wanted to book, but never had the chance to book. And these people are, are people who produce in the top house or techno record labels, you know? So we have people like Ian Pooley, we have people like uh, uh, Donna Ra and, 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 and Frank, uh, Frank Roger, all these people um, considered older for the for the new generation they're not into that music but when they come and see there's a set that has techno it has house it has jazz it has all these different influence so even the artists that do the warm-up they will come and play differently for the next gig when they when they come so it, exposure is is what we really need because we have not grown up with this uh, scene uh, like the rest of Europe or the, the States or so. so it's a new a new thing and This is the best we can do. I'm sure I'm sure other Sector of of the industry will will talk about this But I'm just focusing on the music and how can I bring more quality music? To influence the new generation and 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 try to shape the industry the best way I can I think you did, you did that already, honestly. In Bahrain, it's uh, the amount of great talent, and when I say great, I mean quality talent coming out of Bahrain is insane, um, and it's and it's something I've noticed for the past ten years. I think this is this is all the work that you guys have been doing, honestly. And and Bahrain is a great example of a regional city, aside from Beirut, of course, that is actually creating some really good talent beyond even uh, music. I think uh, you have great designers in Bahrain, great artists. So for sure, culture is there. It's rich. Creativity is quite rich in Bahrain. OK, next question. Uh, and this is the, uh, the kind of difficult one or t for you, for all of us to answer. But how does the economy of a city um, basically benefit from the existence of nightlife? Arne, I, th I think. <laughs> well, I think if you want to have a, 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 a thriving uh, city and therefore uh, a, an economic system that suits that profile, you want to have a fruitful uh, 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 soil. So now we're in the desert, we all know how important it is to have a fruitful soil, uh, soil and it starts with um, um, uh, uh, no inspiration. We all need inspiration. So if you 
managed to get inspirational people together and in the electronic music scene that is not just business people but also uh, actually I would say at the bottom the artists or the creative people not just about music because then I mean I think that's all multidisciplinary so uh, as you mentioned as well visual, uh, visual artists uh, graphic designers and so on and so on as if you make sure these people feel at home in your city then the other industries will be interested in being in that city because that's where the inspiration comes from. And um, I'm sure that if you're able to fac facilitate that and make these people feel comfortable, then that's, that's how you do it, I think. Other industries will adapt to, the, to that and will see your city as an important place to get new ideas, uh, to see where things are moving towards and therefore adjust in a worldwide relationship. Yeah. I can, I can give an example for, for Amsterdam. We have, of course, we have Awakenings Festival, we have Deckmantel Festival, we have Digital Festival, maybe you ever heard of it. Uh, they are like uh, 30,000 people plus. Awakenings is even 50,000 people. Half of them come from out of the Netherlands. They're from abroad. Awakenings welcomes 89 um, uh, different countries people from the 89 different countries. What are they gonna do? They're not gonna fly in, go to Awakenings and leave. They go to the city, they stay in a hotel, they take a taxi, they go to the bar, they go shopping. Uh, so that's, that's no rocket science, that is a massive uh, uh, economical importance. And also, and also quality tourists, because they're, like, they're not going to Deckmantel and then going to Badam to So straight after they're gonna go to a record store so they're gonna go to independent clothing store you know so then they gotta go come to deck mantle of digital or um <clears throat> another uh, hard style festival and uh, then spend their money at stuff that they have already at home so it's also a quality tourist that's coming to explore um what is happening in that city on all kinds of levels and i think um that is something which is often ne neglected by governments uh, of, or by cities um, they always, or often in my opinion, they see um, uh, tourism coming from music and nightlife can also be something which is, um, which can lead to uh, problems or issues, it can lead to uh, no uh, noise or disturbance. But what's interesting from um, when I was in my role of the night mayor, we had a close relationship with uh, the, uh, the city hall and from the police data from Amsterdam Dance Event, so Amsterdam Dance Event, our biggest music conference and festival, 400,000 people attending nowadays. Uh, it, it grew, of course, over 25, uh, 25 years. What was interesting from the police data, it always showed 90,000 foreign visitors, 400,000 visitors, so that the economic impact is huge. But it was always shown from the police data that the, um, uh, for them it wasn't busier than a regular Saturday night. So even if you have so many, so if you have 400,000 people coming to your city in, fi in five days, because they're coming for the music, they won't be crawling down the street like an English tourist, like on a, on a, on a stack party. They will be listening to music and they will be going, you know, in these independent record stores and that kind of stuff. So they will be there. And that is something people really need to embrace. Uh, that, that, you know, electronic music lovers really often are quality tourists. Can I shortly add something to that? Like in the Netherlands, we have quite an advanced system of uh, uh, subsidies that allow certain cultural movements or institutes to grow. And um, that also has some possibilities in it that you start to determine which sectors you want to promote and support and then help those flower, basically. And I guess that's another approach from the government or more from the authorities to inject in certain um, uh, 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 developments, make sure that they have some extra financial security. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna speak on behalf of Beirut because that's where we had the big, big nightlife. Um, it brings a lot of employment to a lot of young men and women and the night economy, obviously you have taxis and it's not just nightclubs, you have bars, you have restaurants, you have after hour restaurants, it employs a ton of people. It's so, so, so important. 
to a place like Beirut? Uh, basically, I think there is like some kind of uh, perception of import or export. Uh, from the import, I think if clubbing has a passport, you know, like that uh, every person in the world that's practicing it would love to have stamp from a different country. So there is a constant thirst for the new experiences and this kind of uh, perception of it. The welcome event that we had uh, for this conference, I know a couple of DJs that would pay to play there because like you have the experience playing in desert and that's not something that someone should book you. Someone should pay for that experience. So, so basically, there is this kind of forming the new experiences and the unique ones and that's something that everybody wants to have. But later on, when you finish with that and you form it, then it's a possibility for expert. Like um, Deck Mantel is doing in Croatia, you know, like Elro is also touring all over the globe. When you find the perfect recipe, then it becomes an export. So, so I think like more unique people go, um, it's much bigger chance to go with the export. And I think that's the reason like why the all unique experience can survive because we don't need to imitate any kind of culture, you know, like something that you have, you can preserve with additional flavor and you can get like something that couldn't become a franchise. Of course, uh, Dutch industry like put it to the max level. For me also was the hook for our conference when I visited the first ADE, I was totally blown away. I figured out I'm like the part of some kind of global thing, you know, like, and it was like a thunder. So I, I, I bring home that kind of energy and try to do a similar thing for the Balkans. So, so basically I, I think this is kind of like domino infection kind of thing that's like con con constantly continues. But I think it's the only, the problem uh, with the unique level is like that internet is allowing us like to, to very easy copy to each other. So I, before the internet, culture had much more like unique flavor. Okay. Guys, sorry, I'm going five minutes over time. Yeah. Just letting you know. Carlo. <laughs> I'm gonna be very sweet and short. Um, so in, in Berlin, we have a huge impact uh, the, the, um, from the nightlife. I have to say that um, even the major has like, there is the club commission, which is the owner of like uh, Bergheim, the owner of Watergate, Treso, and few other clubs that they are in constant, uh, in direct communication with the major, and they are checking out all the time what's going on, how we can apply these rules and wh whatsoever. So um, just to, to make um, um, an appoint, uh, a detail is like, during COVID is the first time that Berlin lost population. Of course, everyone is there for parties. So, like, if there is no parties, like, why the hell I'm gonna be in Berlin? Like, I go to my hometown, or whatever. Um, and yes, everyone say here it has a huge impact in like taxis, kebabs, record shops, and all the rest of uh, people. Plus, we pay a lot of taxes. I have to say that in Berlin, I never play the gig without an invoice. This is like super German for that. So in the end, they, they are very interested on, on this point as well. Well, um, events and economy, they go hand to hand. Uh, it's, this is a concept that's been embraced, especially after COVID in this part of the world. So they're pushing for more events because uh, Events shows healthy economy. People are investing, investing, and they look at it, say, oh, this economy is doing really well. Uh, it brings investors, it brings job opportunities, tourism, etc. like everybody uh, has mentioned that. But this is a new concept for us here. We push in, as you can see, more governments are interested to do bigger events and bigger events. And uh, the example is here, <laughs> it's, it's in Riyadh. So, so hopefully this also reflect back on us in our little tiny island so we can, we can also grow and try to catch up with everyone else. <laughs>